Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful again for the opportunity we have each morning, for the light that you shine upon our path, and for the strength that you give us uh, to obey your word. And we just ask, Lord, that your presence can be here this morning to correct and reprove us. Help us to see our need of you and to be able to understand these things that we can share with others, these truths that um, bring light into the darkness. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Um, so yesterday we were looking at the line of Samson. And the conclusion we came to is that when we originally went through Samson as far as drawing out uh, the events, uh, we had um, basically four different lines, one for chapter 13, one for 14, one for 15, and one for 16. And I don't have the line I drew out for the 16th chapter. I don't know if I just didn't draw it out or what happened, um, maybe it never got saved and we lost it somehow, I don't know. But we know that we can take each of these chapters and each of these chapters is a line. And the way that we looked at Judges uh, 13 to 16 is it was a 3-1 combination, is what I remember. So 13, 14, and 15 were the first, second, and, and third angel's messages, and 16 was the fourth but we had drawn out a line for each of them. And what we're seeking to do here is to draw a line just for all of them together. So that means we would have uh, somehow, and, and, and we tried to draw out 13 as, as you know, the first angel's message and like the darkness, the first angel arriving, it being um, uh, formalized and empowered but it seems that we actually have to take chapter 13 as just the arrival of the first message uh, with the period of darkness being verse one uh, of chapter 13. Whether that's correct or not, still, you know, we're just trying to work this out. So if we uh, uh, take chapter 13 as well, so I'll just go to the end there. I mean, we could take verse 25 because verse 24 is the arrival of the first message. So verse 25 would be um, an increase of knowledge. The spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zor and Eshtal. So when we go to our line that we had begun to draw, You can see here, um, we would just take this and we just put 13, 24, and 25 as these two way marks. So that's going to be the increase of knowledge. So it's not particularly a way mark, but it's, it's something that we have within the line. Now, we also know that there is this laying of the foundation and the work of the enemy, so that we haven't really been adding to these lines. And in the Sunday studies, we're, we're going to be looking at that um, because we're going to be going through how we understood the lines in the past. And, and these things were important parts of the lines. So you'd have uh, from the formalization to the empowerment, this um, laying of the foundation. And then you would have this uh, work of the enemies following this empowerment sometimes attached to the foundation being laid they sort of overlap um, but you'd have this empowerment and then there'd all be all this work of the enemies and then you would have the second message arrive so this sort of persecution uh, that brings about then <clears throat> uh, this second message and you could see that really literally in uh, the decrees Right. So you're going to have an arrival of the first angel's message. 
with uh, Cyrus coming to the throne, and then you're going to have this increase of knowledge. The decree is going to be issued, which would be a formalization. And then they're going to begin laying the foundation of the temple. Um, and then they're going to have this work of the enemies uh, that goes on. That's going to actually stop the laying of the foundation of the temple. And then uh, you have the prophesying of uh, Haggai and Zechariah with the second angel arriving. The formalization is going to be the decree. And then the empowerment is going to be um, uh, this uh, dedication of the temple. And then in that period, you're going to have this story of Esther. Um, which is a, um, a parallel to Samuel Snow. And then you're going to have the third angel arrive. That's going to be Artaxerxes' decree, right? And then you're going to have Artaxerxes' second decree that's going to be the fourth angel. So, so in that line, which begins the 2300 days, we, we didn't start there. We started with the line of the Millerites, and we used that terminology prior to even understanding the line of the three degrees, So, which I found interesting that the terminology that was used in our understanding of Millerite history really does come from uh, the story of the three decrees, yet we didn't connect it till later. It's just kind of amazing to me how that came about. But anyway, when we're looking at the line of Samson, you know, and when we've been drawing these other lines, we haven't added in those details. Um, and there's other things, too. There's going to be, uh, uh, you know, at the end, when the third angel arrives, there's this number seven attached to it uh, in various different ways. In all these lines, we haven't addressed those details too much. But now when we're looking at the line of Samson, we're going to see that that we should be able to, to draw out this line, whether we understood it correctly before or not, and how we applied these, uh, these messages. I do think that it makes the most sense to put the birth of Samson in the whole line of Samson as the arrival of the first message. So the first angel arrives there at the birth of Samson. And, and, and he's a fulfillment of a prophecy, right? So there's a prophecy that, that occurs. So we have the period of darkness or the prophecy that, that shows the end of that period of darkness and his birth showing the arrival of that message. For people who sort of agreed this makes sense, any observations? But it does make sense. The, the one thing that I ran across in notes yesterday in what we've been talking about from Judges 13 mm -hmm. had a reference from Signs of the Times, February 26th, 1902. And in the, in the third paragraph of that document, it says that for 40 years, the children of Israel were constantly harassed and at times completely subjugated by this cruel and warlike nation, the Philistines. They had mingled with these idolaters, uniting with them in commerce, in pleasure, even in worship, until they seemed to be identified with them in spirit and in interest. Then these professed friends became their bitterest enemies and sought by every means to accomplish their destruction. Now, in the following paragraph, there is a sentence that stands out that really adds to what we have been have been saying about Samson being a type of Christ. So mm -hmm. in, the, in the fourth paragraph, it states that in all Israel, there was not to be found a man through whom the Lord could work for the, for the deliverance of his people. So it's kind of interesting to see that at this point, because in all Israel, 
when Christ came, there was not anyone, whether you're speaking man or angel, that could satisfy the claims of the law of Jehovah. So here you have Samson being predicted because there was no other person through whom the Lord could work for the deliverance of his people. Yeah. And there's becomes this whole uh, interconnected idea dealing with uh, <clears throat> uh, the prophecy of Manasseh in Isaiah seven that is a, a messianic prophecy dealing with um the start of the 2520 for judah when manasseh right. is taken captive and um you know tying this you know to the prophecy of course christ's birth and then here with samson's right so you have this prophetic symbol that's cons uh, consistent with this idea of this promised seed. And right. the whole thing of the period of the judges that I don't think is well uh, well understood. We, we often don't really consider this line of the judges um, in connection with the promised seed, but it is sort of a, um, a question of you know where does this succession occur you know how are we going to see what was promised you know to, first to adam and eve and then given through abraham and then joseph uh or jacob you know when he's blessings his sons and you have in the story of joseph you have this whole type with this chiasm of of joseph connecting to this chiasm of israel and then they get delivered from egyptian bondage and then they go into this period of the judges. Right. And then and then you're going to have, uh, you know, them getting a king, Saul. But he's he's the choice of the people. And then you have God's choice, David, who's a man after God's own heart. And David is definitely a type of Christ. Agreed. And yet, you know, David himself, I mean, he's you know, he has some failings, right? But, you know, you can look at the Psalms, for instance, where David is is talking about his experience, and these are actually Christ's experience, you know, Psalm 22, you know, um, and other things, you know, Psalm, whatever it is, 51. Well, you know, so you have, and Psalm 40, and, and all these different things that point forward to Christ's experience as a man. Well, in, in this situation, like, like what we were just saying, yeah. if we go back to part of the presentation on Sabbath, the following sentence outlines something even further. The erroneous education given to children, indulgence of appetite and conformity to the practices of heathenism, had greatly lessened physical and moral power. In that sentence, the indulgence of appetite, the first test given to Christ, mm -hmm. conformity to the practices of heathenism, presumption, and then the erroneous education given to children, the love of the world, outline these three steps again that we could apply to the first second and third angels message so mm -hmm. is mrs white then saying a there was no man in israel where that the lord could work through for deliverance i think we've agreed you know here is samson as a type of christ but is this also then saying that the children of Israel at that time had just as much need of the messages of Revelation 14 as we do. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, of course, they, they, um, they weren't ready. 
you know, things had to unfold, of course, for these well, things I mean, to be meaningful. But I mean, that's the problem that that I'm having right now when it comes to we take this story of the judges, right? So, I mean, we know it has this historical place and application, but we're making this application to our movement at this time, which is very remarkable right. that we can do this in the manner that we've done it. Um, you know, for instance, I'll just bring up this image uh, that I had shown earlier, wherever it is. Right, so this is just a drawing Stephen has done, which, which is basically, um, you know, he says, maybe, right? Uh, because we're still trying to work out exactly how we understand the chronology chronology of the judges. But, you know, here we have, we studied Tola and Jay year, right? And that was that 23 and 22 years, which made up 45 years that we had recognized. And then Stephen has taken this period of when the Ammonite oppression begins, following that, you're going to have um, this 18 years, and then Jephthah is going to judge. And the way that Stephen has worked this out is he's got seven years uh, where Eli dies. That means there's this overlap of these period of the judges that isn't specifically mentioned, right? And then then there's going to be 20 years until Samuel is invested as a judge. And you're going to have this 18, 7, and 20, which, of course, is the main symbol, 18720, that we have for July 18, 2020. And this, of course, is an interesting observation that 18, 7, and 20 add, add up to 45. So whether this chronology is exactly correct, this is still a truth, 18, 7, and 20 add up to 45 which uh, the July 18, 2020 prediction occurs in, you know, the time of the 45th president and all the symbols attached to that. Um, so, so we just have these, these remarkable connections between the story of the judges and our movement and its prediction. Um, so, so this is where we're, we're maybe struggling. Well, we're definitely struggling trying to understand it. But, you know, why is this happening? Why can we make this application? What does it mean as far as our responsibility um, to, to the church, right? Our responsibility to uh, giving a message to Seventh-day Adventists. How do we encapsulate this message? How do we deliver it? Um, obviously, it's going to be in God's providence and leading. It's not going to be something that we can just uh, figure out and, and just do. God is going to lead us step by step. But we can see that what he's doing right now in this movement is leading us to address the problems first within ourselves and then within the movement. And these seem impossible, you know, both of them, um, to address the problems within ourselves. That's something that's you know, we've struggled with for years and years and years, at least I have, um, you know, to see what it is God wants me to see about myself and allow him to correct it. And then, of course, the impossibility of, of me having any effect on anyone else, um, their decisions are their decisions. I can't make them for them. I have a hard enough time for myself. So, so God going, is going to have to perform a miracle. Right. Not just in in my life, but in the lives of of all the people in the movement who are then going to give this message. And so all these things come together. But I, I guess the point is, when you look at at Samson, you know, there's no one right in the time of Christ. All there there's going to Christ is going to come and he's going to deliver his people. If Samson is typifying this movement, I mean. He's, he's showing exactly the problems that we have, is that we have all of these problems. Um, we're impulsive. Uh, you know, we're controlled by our passions. And yet God is somehow going to use us 
just as he used Samson. So, you know, to me, it's, it's, I mean, it's really the story of the Bible, God using the most unlikely individuals to fulfill his purposes. And this work of salvation, restoring the image of God in man. It's, you know, it's, it's just something that's really hard to believe in a sense just because of what we see with our eyes. We don't see this happening. Um, you know, some of us might be deluded that we, you know, that we see it happening in ourselves. Um, but it's not something we ever should look for in ourselves because it only comes through Christ, through the knowledge of understanding of him. And, and this is clearly shown in the story of Samson. So... <clears throat> Um, is that helpful at all? My my ramblings there. Dwight? I think that was a good point that you've been making. So okay. and that fits with what you were trying to say, I think. Yes, it does. Okay, so now we're gonna have uh so we had this increase of knowledge. We're saying that that last verse 1325 is this increase of knowledge. So then we go into the story of Samson's marriage. And now we looked at a lot of these symbols before. Um, now, in Samson's marriage, there's going to be, uh, of course, this lion. So we started talking about that. Uh, where is it here? Um, so I'm just going to show you this here. Um, this lion roaring, right? Now, when we looked at this before, we had this lion roaring as 11.9 and 9.11 and 11.9. And then we looked at uh, Revelation chapter 10. And we looked at Daniel chapter 12, just sort of briefly, because, I mean, we've studied those in depth before. Um. So this is a way mark, this line roaring, that ties 9-11 and 11-9 together. It brings us back to Millerite history as well. So the lion roaring is a symbol of what? What is it that the lion roars about? Would we not apply that as to the understanding of a major message? Okay, so if we go back to uh, Revelation chapter 10, so that's kind of where we had skirted around that at least uh, yesterday. So we know, we know in Revelation chapter 10, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was upon his head, and his face as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. This is Christ. This is the lamb that was slain with seven horns and seven eyes that was able to open the book, right? To unseal the, the book that was sealed with seven seals, right? Correct. Okay. Because that's, you know, Revelation uh, chapter five, you got this book in the right of the hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now this one on the throne is Christ. It's not the father in chapter four. It's, it's the son. Ellen White clearly shows this when, when you put together her statements about this event, that the rainbow is above Christ's head. It's he's the one seated upon the throne. Now, he has in his hand this book. Um, and then it says, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. But it's going to be the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals. But when we see him, we see him as a lamb slain 
with seven horns and seven eyes. Right. And he comes and takes the book in, in a sense out of his own hand. Right. That is Christ seated upon the throne. Can't open that book. Christ has to come and die for us in order to open the book. Right. So Christ's death on the cross is the thing that unseals this scroll or this book. When you get to chapter 10 and you see Christ now with this little book open. Of course, this is the book of Daniel and the book of Daniel in chapter 12 is the book that's sealed. Now, Ellen White says that in that book is contained in symbolic language, basically the history of the whole world. Right. So, I mean, this is it in a sense compasses more than the book of Daniel, but the book of Daniel encapsulates all prophecy. Right. So, but here it's a little book open. Um, so we know that there is part of that book is unsealed. And at the time of the end in 1798, that book is opened. Right. So that's what we understand as Seventh day Adventists. And then it's going to express Millerite history. But it says, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So this is a proclamation of a prophecy. And that prophecy is expressed in these seven thunders. But these seven thunders are going to be sealed up. They're unsealed in our time, right? So the primary purpose of, of this movement in repeating Millerite history is to unseal what was sealed up in Millerite history. And, and the way that Adventists would have understood it in the past was after the disappointment, the early development of Adventism was understanding Millerite history that in a sense, we now understood our disappointment, those seven thunders have been unsealed, but Ellen White doesn't use that application, right? She, when, when she writes about Revelation chapter 10, she shows that they're unsealed in a repeat of history And, and the way that this movement tried to understand the seven thunders, which was partially correct, is that they looked at the seven thunders as the seven way marks um, that we have in our line. So that they would be seven events in Millerite history. But that wasn't quite correct in that the seven thunders are uh, contained um, they contain, or the way that they're unsealed, I can't remember how she says it. Um, here, I'm going to just quickly grab the paper, because I have that paper on the Seven Thunders. Um, let's see if we can quickly find it. Okay, so there's a paper called The Seven Thunders in their un Unsealing. Um, and that didn't work. And the, the idea there, anyway, is that um, when in our history these seven thunders are unsealed, they're unsealed by us repeating the events of Millerite history. So without repeating those events, we couldn't possibly unseal the seven thunders. So Millerite, early Millerite history could not have unsealed the seven thunders. because they needed to be unsealed in the repeat of history. Yeah, she says that these relate to future events, which will be disclosed in their order. So future events, not, not the events of Millerite history, which is how most people read this. You know, after these seven thunders utter their voices, 
the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. She says, these relate to future events will be, which will be disclosed in their order. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. John sees the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's messages to be giving, given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. And um, then she also says the special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation that means to set upon a line of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. It was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. In, in the order of God, most wonderful and advanced truths would be proclaimed. The first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before these messages had done their specific work. This is represented by the angel standing with one foot on the sea, proclaiming with a most solemn oath that time should be no longer. Um, so she says, this time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither a probationary time, but a prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. Um, so when, we, when people read this passage, for instance, when I've read this, this passage in the past, and this is in 7a, but it's also, I think, originally, I can't remember where it's originally from, um, anyway, it's easy to find it. It's in 7 Bible Commentary 971. Um, let me see here. Okay, so... Just reading over this. <clears throat> so anyway, the point that we're, we're getting to here, um, at least that I'm trying to get to, has to do with the fact that in Revelation chapter 10, we have a match for Revelation 12, or Daniel chapter 12, pardon me. These two chapters go together. And this sealing of the book of Daniel, it's unsealed in the Revelation. And in its unsealing, a part of that message is going to be sealed up in the seven thunders. And that seven thunders is unsealed in a repetition of history. So what happened in Christ's time to unseal this book, we know that it, it takes time for this book to be unsealed. So Christ dies upon the cross, um, sealing up vision and prophecy, but it's going to take Millerite history to first show that unsealing, right? Because it's, it's going to be at the time of the end that Daniel's book is unsealed. So 1798. But then in order for those seven thunders to be unsealed, we have to repeat that history. And so the seven thunders are not the events, but they show the delineation of events. That is, in our history, as we've moved through the study of, of prophecy, and as those prophecies have been fulfilled, we then receive the understanding of the events in Millerite history, their, their timing and their significance. And, and one of the main contributions that this movement has to Adventism is the one that we, we often don't really emphasize in the sense of, you know, what is our message? 
you know, we're always looking at, you know, what's going to happen. But the main part of our message is what has happened. That is, what happened in Millerite history needs to be understood by Seventh-day Adventists. And I know to a great degree, our primary message to Adventists is to show them how what happened in the three decrees that commenced the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, how it's connected with the three angels' messages. So right now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is studying the three angels' messages. So you've got Mark Finley, who's written a quarterly that is basically devoid of the understanding of Millerite history. So how can we proclaim those messages if we don't even understand their significance and, and where they occurred? Right? This would be a major problem for Seventh-day Adventists. Agreed. You know, so, I mean, his, it, the kind of the fluff that you see in this, uh, this quarterly is, to me, just, I, I don't, I mean, I understand it in the sense how it happens. But, you know, it's like, and, and just to have it open here so you can kind of see. So this is... This is the quarterly, and I've, I've looked through it, um, you know, and it's fine in a sense. I mean, there isn't a great deal of error. I mean, uh, a lot of stories and, and sort of anecdotes and types of things that, you know, Adventists like, sort of sentimental things as well. And, of course, you know, things, you know, the Sabbath is important and all that kind of stuff. But it's not really any understanding of the three angels' messages in Millerite history. This is all baby food. Yes. And 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 more than baby food. I mean it's 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 not healthy baby food. It's you know Okay, so it's Pablum. Yeah. 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 Well yeah. So it's it's that um, you know, because we never used baby food when we fed our kids. But uh you know, nothing bought in the store. But anyway, uh, but this is just processed, highly processed, sort of empty. Uh, it's definitely not going to bring about a reformation in Adventism. So, so this is the problem that we have, is that we have this message that we don't even fully understand, that we we can't possibly bring to the Adventist church because of our characters. I mean, um, you know, we, we've done a lot uh, to do. A, we've done a lot of damage in how we've, how this movement has, has operated, not so much, you know, at the top with Jeff, but uh, really with the members and how they have interacted with church members to create the sort of uh, prejudice um, that was unnecessary that I always kept fighting against. I mean, that was, there is a way to present truth. Um, but you know, going in a head to head battle is not one way to do it. Um, manifesting an unchrist like character is not a way to do it. And that's what we saw in Canada, at least. So, <clears throat> So anyway, you know, we have this, uh, you know, now we're going to, you know, try to take this all and understand this in the context of the message, the story of Samson. And, and it becomes a message that directly speaks to this movement, but it's going to have this message dealing with this lion roaring. And, and this is 9-11, right? But with this lion is going to come this riddle, right? The lion and the honey. So, so we get to this, because if you're looking at these lines here, so we have chapter 13, but here's chapter 14 at the bottom, right? And we get to July 18, 2020. We're going to say that that's what that riddle is about. It's that symbol. 
And Samson's name, you know, it forwards and backwards in the gematria adds up to 81. So it's kind of an interesting symbol. And then we're going to have the 30, 30, 30, which is going to give us that 777 symbol. And we know from July 18. Um, and, and so what we could have done with this, if we you know put this up here, is this is going to be the 252. And this is going to be the 525, right? So this is this whole thing is let's borrow this. Like this. So this puzzle. This isn't gonna work, it's kind of crowded, but this way. here okay <clears throat> Oops. okay so when we're dealing with Samson here you can see how this makes sense now That makes sense. So you can see that that 30, 30, 30 in the story of chapter 14 is going to give us that 252 and the 525. So that from 11, 9, and that's what we're saying that 9, 11 and 11, 9 are the same way, Mark. So that's why the line roaring there is twice. And um so that's good. the line in the honey is that 252 days, and then there's 525 to December 25th, 2021. That's going to be Judges 1414. 14. So, but this is just in the line of Judges 14, right? Now, if we're going to place this then on, um, so many lines here there it is so here we have the line of samson here um and that's below the chapter 15 one so if we're going to put a line roaring uh where are we going to place it in this line and, and we haven't even added a date yet to the birth of samson on our line we're just saying that 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 is there so but the lion roaring is what symbol in this line, this line of Samson? Do you understand what I'm asking? Would we place that as the formalization of the second angel's message? Yes. Well, of the second angels or the first? Well, I'm just... We, we had several things that we were considering yesterday regarding the messages. So it could easily be the formalization of the first angel's message, but I was also having to consider the second angel's message, given our time frame. Okay. Well, I would say it's the first angel's message, if we're going to take the line of Samson as representing our history. Okay. So, so the birth of Samson has to be 9-11. Right, is how I understand it. Samson's going to show us this entire line. So down here, we're going to have 9 11. Right, that's what I'm, so that's going to be the arrival of the first message. That's the birth of Samson. So Samson represents what symbol, what is Samson as a symbol? How do we understand Samson? Now, it's it's the arrival of the third angel's message in the line of the judges, right? So it's the seventh way mark. Correct. Okay. 
we have Samson. We know that his his name means sunlight, right? He has this symbol of 81 in his gematria, reversed and forward gematria. But if we're placing him at 911, that's his birth, right? Um, he's going to have this. So he's Christ, remember. So, and, and Christ is seeing this Philistine woman who really is not desirable in the sense of, you know, morally. Um, but Christ is coming to redeem us. Now, when he uh, goes down to Timnath, this, this is also Timna, right? So what was, um, so what is this place symbolize? What was this? What was this about Timna? Timna. So Timla, Timna equals a portion. Right, it means a portion. Um, it's also connected with the uh, properly to weigh. But we have a Timna that is a Philistine city. We also have Timna of Dan. Right. So in this case, um, so there's the town on the northern boundary of Judah, Judah later assigned to Dan, and a town in the hill country of Judah. Um, what it says here in Brown Drivers Briggs. Um, yeah, now it, it, it's also connected to the word manna, right? That is the weighing out of the manna, right? Which is the meaning. Right, the meaning, meaning, kiko, you parse. Okay. Yeah, so, it looks like the word kind of looks like it too. Mana. Yeah, it's it's timana. Is you just adding a tet to the beginning of it? Okay. Right. So that's why it's a portion. That's what the T means. It's a portion of a weight. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So it's a portion of a mina? A mana. I, I was looking at it as, as a portion of many, many tekel eupharsin, the mini. Yeah, I know. I, I know what you're saying. I'm just saying that mini is not really a, a Hebrew. That's um, that's Aramaic. Okay. Right. <laughs> that's why it's 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 in Aramaic, right? In in chapter uh, chapter five. It's not in uh, Hebrew. Okay. So. Um, So if we're looking at this, um, Samson's marriage, right? He's, he's going to go down to Timnah. That's the first thing. So you have the increase of knowledge. He's going to go down to Timnah. Um, and we're going to apply it on this line, right? So we're going to say that this is going to relate to the formalization of the message. That's what we would first assume. And... Uh, so he goes down to Timnah to do that. That's a portion. 
It's a portion of a mana. Just a mana is a weight. So it's applied to uh, uh, either 50 or 60 shekels, depending. Um, but this does relate us to the 2520, right, to that understanding of weighing and of time. Yeah, so Daniel 4, so that's also going to be relating to the 2520. Uh, Angela has a note there. Okay, um, so, uh, and Angela also says the line represents us too. Yeah. Um, I don't know in this context if I would apply that, but I have to think about that. Well, since the lions searched their meat from God, right? They're roaring for, to be fed from God. So we are the young lions. Yeah, but it, yeah, it depends what you mean, right? Represents us. I mean, it, it really represents Christ, Christ in us. But, but anyway, um, so we have this Timna. Um, where he's going to go down there and he's going to then talk to his father and mother. He wants to get this woman. Now, how would we apply this? What is it specifically that shows a formalization of a message? And, and then it's going to be when he goes down to Timna the second time. When his father and mother go down, right? And he comes to the vineyards of Timna. Behold, there's a young lion roareth against him. Now, um, so this lion that's roaring is a prophetic message, Right? And, and I would say that we, you know, we would probably have that as the formalization, or are we going to argue that it's the empowerment of the first message? I would say it's the formalization, but. And then what date would we give to it? Any thoughts? Got a question. So when you say formalized, can you can you give me um, not necessarily an example, but what, what are the ways that we consider a formalization of something? Isn't that when um, something is like enacted yeah so well the primary way that we first looked at formalization was you have william miller he's going to receive his concordance in 1798 right at the time of the end and uh, there's going to be this increase of knowledge now included in that is going to be his experience um at the the Battle of Lake Champlain or Plattsburgh. And then there's going to be the anniversary, uh, you know, two years later. And then he's going to have a study of two years at the end of two years in, you know, 17, or 1818. He's going to um, come to the understanding that that message is going to be uh, fulfilled in about 25 years. But the formalization doesn't happen until he is ordained as a Baptist minister, right? And even then, two years before that, he does his first presentation. But still, we don't generally mark that as the formalization. Well, sometimes we just put the two together. 39, 33. But the point is, the message is put into a form that it is then given, right? Okay, that's... 
that's yeah. So if we're looking at our history, there there comes a point in which our message um, is formalized, but it's going to be empowered, right? So that's the other thing is you have to think about um, what is what is the message is that arrives, what constitutes its formalization, and then how that leads to the empowerment of that message. So, so it can show up in lots of different ways, depending on what kind of message it is. Now, the period of darkness then in the story of Samson, we, we still, we know it's this 40 years um, Philistine oppression, but we would have to look at that as having to do with an understanding of the scriptures, right? In our history. That's how we've been. Hey, Theodore, with um, 1840 be the empowerment? Well, 1840 is the empowerment in Millerite history, but we're applying this to our history. Yeah. Right? So if we go back to our line here, um, we know that there's this lion roaring, right? And that we would, we can place that at 9-11 in our history. But if we're taking the story of Samson, we have to be able to place it at two places. That is, um, our line contains two 9-11s. One event, but one is the empowerment of the, the first angels and the, the arrival of the second. But we know that this line of Samson here is a zoom into the second angel's message arriving as being 9-11, not the empowerment of the first angel. That is our history, our movement from 9-11 to 2023 that's represented in the story of the judges is an understanding of the arrival of the second angel's message as being 9-11. Right. That's that's what's being illustrated by our movement at the present time. Is how the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down at 9-11, not how 9-11 um, parallels um, August 11th, 1840. Does that make sense to people, what I'm saying there? Because this is this is what we've come to understand. <clears throat> so when we look at this line of, of Samson, we're going to put 9-11 as the arrival of this first angel, because this is a zoom into the arrival of the second angel in our history. That is, the whole line of the judges is, but Samson is the arrival of the third angel message in the line of the judges and it comprises that entire line but there is Samson leads us to a certain point because the third angel's message in this movement right not the third angel's message on the on the big line but in this movement that's where we're coming to we're, we're this movement has been going through an experience that has been illustrated by the line of the judges. And Samson embodies the completion of this, but covers the entire period. Because the darkness here is the Philistine oppression, which is how we study the Bible, correct? That's what we determine. Yeah, that's how we have understood this. That this movement is is involved in an understanding of the scriptures that is not compatible with Philistine understanding of the scriptures. That is with the Protestant scholarly understanding of the scriptures. It's a different way of studying the Bible. It's really an expansion of Miller's rules, which have been abandoned 
because the church adopted the worldly way of studying the scriptures. And in doing so, in trying to support the Adventist beliefs with that method, they eventually eroded our understanding of the prophecies. They, they, they were directly attacking and are directly attacking Adventism. The foundation of Adventism is being attacked by our scholars, which is why they reject the 2300 days and the 2520. And, and if you remember, when, when I came into this movement in 2010, there was lots of people in this movement who really wanted Jeff to go to the conference and correct them. And what was Jeff's response? How has Jeff always responded when it came to people who wanted us to talk to the leading ministers or talk to Doug Batchelor or talk to Walter Weiss or, or whatever? How did Jeff always respond? For those that know. What would he say? Anybody know? He would say it's a waste of time. Why would he say it's a waste of time? But, but why won't they listen? So Heidi said they probably wouldn't listen. Why won't they listen? Okay. So, so I mean, there's a spiritual Didn't issue. hear that. So she says it's because they're just interested in congratulating themselves instead of honoring, honoring God, which well, is part of the worldly education. Didn't they want to, the basic is they don't want to be a peculiar people that stands out. They want to yeah. be like the other people. Like the world. Like the world. Yeah. Like uh, Heidi and I are, are now reading fifth testimonies because we finished nine testimonies. And uh, uh, Fifth Testimonies, Ellen White has a section dealing with our college near the beginning of the book. And there, I mean, she's basically describing what ended up happening to our colleges, just following the worldly pattern. It was be being introduced way back then. Um, but we study the Bible so differently that we can't actually, especially, you know, if you look at, you know, 12 years ago, 2010, well, I guess 13 years ago now, um, when I came into the movement, you, you couldn't possibly, you had nothing in common in how we were studying. Their whole approach would not allow them to look at the 2520 or anything that we were doing. First off, who are we? You know, nobodies. So they're just not even interested. So to go to them and try to say, you know, you need to look at what we're studying, well, they have no interest in it. It's not going to fit into anything that they've been seeking to do. And even, you know, friends of mine who are pastors, you know, if I'd show them these things, they'd say, well, what good is it? You know, how am I going to use that in an evangelistic series? Well, of course, they could use it in an evangelistic series, but not the way that they want to do evangelism. You know, the first problem that I see with Adventism is Adventism is so interested in getting people to be Adventists. First, right, they're not really concerned about people being converted because they themselves aren't converted, right? So... All you do is you search sea and land to find one proselyte and make him two full times uh, uh, a child of, of, of hell than ye are yourselves. Something to that effect. So my observation is that they, when they, they, all they're interested in is to get you uh, to sign on to those 28 or whatever many number uh, tenants. They don't they even use. care about that. They just want to get you in the church so that they can collect your tithe money 
<laughs> well, there's care. that too. They don't care what you believe, to be honest. Because they don't. I mean, even when I was baptized, the pastor, you know, he just present the minimalistic amount of, of Adventist truth that I had to accept in order to get baptized. Because right? I didn't even accept all the things at that point because I didn't even understand them. I just knew I wanted to get baptized. I'd been keeping the Sabbath. I understood the state of the dead. Didn't know much about the sanctuary message or anything like that. But he just wanted to get me baptized because I'd be going to church and paying my tithe. Right. So when when I did all of my evangelistic work through the years, I was never interested in getting somebody to join the church. I was only interested in getting people to study the scriptures for themselves to teach them how to study the bible to come to know christ and if they joined the church you know if that's what they felt that they wanted to do i wasn't going to stop them but the idea was not to get people to join the church that was never my intent i've only ever had one convert um so you know and that's a lot of years of evangelism and work you know personal effort I planted a lot of seeds. I believe that that will reap a harvest at some point, but I wasn't that interested in getting them becoming Adventists. Um, probably almost zero interest in getting them becoming Adventists because that's going to kill them spiritually belonging to these churches. So <clears throat> anyway, the, you know, the point is we have, um, because your question was specifically relating to formalization. So we kind of went a bit off track there. Um, but when it comes to what this movement is doing, that it's correcting an understanding of the scriptures, the formalization of that message, I would place at 11.9. Why would I do that other than just that I like 9-11 and 11-9. Uh, I could be wrong here, you know, because we could argue it's somewhere else. But why would I choose 11-9 as a formalization of this message that arrived at 9-11? Considering that this darkness is Philistine oppression that represents a lack of understanding of the scriptures. What happens at 11.9, that would be a formalization of this message that this movement has had since 9.11. Well, we're speaking 11.9 of 2019, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we're speaking of a time where the movement has now become 30 years of age, mm -hmm. much like Christ, much like Samuel, now prepared to begin giving a message, even if we're not fully understanding the message. Yes. And we know that we just had a battle with Parminder. And Parminder represents, uh, embodies everything that's wrong with Adventism. In spades. That's why they became woke, because the logical conclusions of modern Adventist thought is that you need to follow the world. You need to accept all of these things that the world accepts. And that's what Parminder's movement did. And that's because of... of how they studied the scriptures, which I think is kind of remarkable because we think about this movement, Parminder's a part of this movement um, at that time. He becomes an ordained elder. He's supposed to take over the role of the leader of the movement, but he's in total apostasy to everything this movement stands for. And he's even the one that introduced time setting. And and in some ways, it's almost like a ruse that he introduced it. I mean, if you think about it. Because he introduces it and opens up the door for the understanding of all this chronological work that I did. 
to now speak, right? And and really with uh, eleven nine, what we have is is lots of different symbols that we already connected. We have the two seventy three, the connection of prophecy. So when we get to November 9th, uh, 2019, uh, we now have, we have July 18, 2020 in place. We have had this, this, this whole message all comes together. Everything comes together. And so it's a formalization of that message that results from 9-11. That would seem agreeable. Yeah. So to me, it's a formalization of that message. That's what happens there. But it's definitely not an empowerment. And I don't think it's a net, another message, a second message. And so no, to but me, it, it does bring everything into an order. Yes. Now, of course, it's a formalization of a message. And who's going to be tested by this message is this movement. Right, so this movement is going to be tested by that message of of chronology that is firmly set in place at eleven nine. So, so there's a, a bunch of things that lead up to that to eleven nine. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to take nine eleven and, I mean. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you could say 11.9 is the arrival of the second message or something like that. But since Samson is on the line above, the arrival of the third angel's message, he's primarily going to be addressing these, uh, these events that are that presently the movement has been tied up with since 11.9. Right. So we know that Samson arrives at 9-11 because he arrives at 9-11 because why? Why do I have him arriving at 9-11? What was the reason? Because we addressed the lion roaring at 9-11, did we not? Uh, yeah. Okay. So if we know that the line roaring at 9-11, and 11-9 is the same way, Mark. So when it comes to this movement at the present time, that that has to be the formalization of this message. So that increase of knowledge is this increase of knowledge from 9-11 to 11-9. So it, it becomes a message that is formalized. So when we first started to draw out this line, we were drawing this line out with, you know, chapter 13 kind of being the first message. And, but now, but, but here I think that this fits much better, taking, um, and, and the verse that we have here then is we're just going to take, um, I was going to take a verse here. Um, so all of this other stuff that we had, you know, drawn on these lines before, because um, we had fourteen four, which is one hundred forty four thousand symbol. Um, but we're going to basically take fourteen verse five as this line that roars. So. I mean, it's it's more involved than just that one verse, but um, that's where I'd put this fourteen verse five, because that's where the lion roars. Now, the thing is, we could take this whole formalization, and we could create a line, and that line would be in chapter uh, fourteen, just de dealing with that marriage part of things. Right, so. So there's definitely a lot of detail that can be drawn uh, from each of these way marks. But we're just going to put this as this line. It's that line roaring. That's going to be that formalization. Because 11.9 is 9.11. So 
as a zoom into the second angel arriving, that would be why we put 11.9 there as the formalization. Is, is that making sense? And it's sort of a rambling explanation, but. Uh, yes, it's making sense to me. Because what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with these dates here in this line of Samson. And we know that in this line of Samson, we're going to have things that we see when we drew out Samson. We're going to have December 25th, 2021, Colin's presentation and Odilio's presentation. And we're going to have January 11th, 2023. And we're saying January 11th, 2023 is the way mark that marks Samson in the line of the judges. But if we continue with Samson, um, and especially once we, we look at Samson and Delilah, um, we're going to see that this leads to April 5th, 2030, right? So, so this line of Samson, its primary, what we're going through right now in this movement is we're coming to an understanding of our present and future duty responsibility as well as understanding what that message is how how we are going to proceed in this movement and we know that not everyone in this movement is going to want to proceed with our present duty that is the majority of the movement and i say it's the majority because it's always the majority the majority of the movement is not going to receive this further light. Why? There's a cross to bear with it. Well, you, in order to receive the third message, you have to be benefited by the, the second, second, right? Correct. And, right. And so we can see that the movement at, so far has not been benefited by the second. Right. So, you know, how that's going to happen and how they're going to receive the third, this third message in, in this line of the judges, which is about our movement, you know, many rejected July 18th. Now some have still tentatively accepted it, but not really. Right. That is, they're not allowing the, the message to accomplish the work. So Angela has one of her cri cri uh, cryptic messages there. Um, I have no idea what she's talking about. Actually, it's it, it's fairly direct. I mean, we should be comparing Judges 14.5 with Revelation 14.5. Yeah. yeah. So Judges 14.5, but um, so 18 years between 2001 and 2019. So six times six times six is 18. And John 666, the schism between true and false followers. I don't know if I could jump to just. No, I mean, the, the situation between the 2001 and the 2019 being the span of 18 years. Yeah. Um, as I had been looking at this, 18 is a reversal of 81 yes mm -hmm. and right. 80, 81 was the age wasn't it that mrs white said was the worst general conference of her life yep now this she was at 11 she did 11 presentations as well right so isn't this basically showing us uh almost like a a midnight but in a chiastic structure where your your 2001 is where the church itself accepted spiritual formation and 2019 is where the movement began to wake up to its responsibility of needing to give a message Agreed. 
Yeah, well, and and also, really, the majority of the movement accepted spiritual formation because part of it is basically teaching spiritual formation. Exactly. I mean, his stuff is so similar to the Jesuit understanding of spirituality and how to understand truth. It, it's remarkable how close he parallels that. And yet, you know, as as she was looking at this with the six, 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 or six to the third power, man, 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 and it's it's relying more on the strength and the wisdom of man than ever relying upon the wisdom of our heavenly father. Yeah, I'm not saying all I'm th- what I'm saying is that it, it's just the whole just looking at it. I know. It's just this jump of you looking at these two verses and seeing all these symbols. It totally makes um, sense. So so you know because Revelation 14 obviously the three angels messages. Um but that's going to be Um, you know, that in their mouth was found no guile, for they are with fault before the throne of God. But, um, you know, we also have, you know, 14.4, right? So the 144,000 symbol just before that. So, um, so it says in 14.4, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever the he goeth these were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto god and to the lamb i mean this is a far contrast from samson morally speaking so what i would see is you know when we look at samson we look at what humanity is and and what we are right and we're far from the character of christ and yet we're going to demonstrate God's power over sin. And that's because we're going to be redeemed. Amen. And there you have the first fruits too. Yeah. So, I mean, there's tons and tons of symbols that come together here in the story of Samson and that have come together in our movement. But so when we get to 11-9, when we get to November 9th, um the significance of what is happening there on November 9th, because you know it was supposed to be this close of probation and you know all these different things that Parminder's movement was looking for. But it was all just a manipulation on Parminder's part. I don't know if Parminder ever thought that any of this stuff was going to happen. Because he basically seems to uh, have used it simply to create a separation in the movement to take his followers with him. Um, but, you know, in, in a sense, it backfires because, you know, that whole thing of predicting November 9th was undermined by all of the chronology that witnessed to it. You know, and Parminder at first didn't see that. Right. He didn't see that. It was, you know, um, that everything that I was doing, he might have seen it. But I think, he, you know, when it came to what happened on October 13th and why he had me speak about the three hundred ninety one and a half was just he might have thought, well, this is going to help his case. But I, I'm pretty sure he must have regretted it because it actually completely undermined his case. Because it brought with it all of this other chronology that he had already rejected. There's no way that he, 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 you know, so it was in God's providence that he, he was, you know, supporting it initially. But July 18th, which comes from that chronology completely undermined what they were trying to do. So, so this is the line that roars. This is an unsealing of prophecy. That's what happens at 11.9. Now, the empowerment of that, 
um, you know, that's what we're going to have to deal with tomorrow. And, and we might, you know, we might have some ways in which we um, sort this out that's slightly different because the, here we're still doing things tentatively. Okay, any final thoughts here? Now, I, I'm going to send people these other lines that I have just to kind of remind people about uh, these other symbols that are coming. Because we're going to have these 300 foxes. There's a bunch of things. And then I also still hope Stephen can join us with some of these studies this week uh, to address his chronology of the judges. Because I think that's relevant. Is okay. that what you were going over this morning? Yeah. Okay. I, I'd seen that uh, chart, but I just didn't know where it came from. Yeah. It came from Stephen. Yeah. So, so did he have it on WhatsApp? No, he just sent it to me that I know of. I mean, he might have sent it to someone else too, but <clears throat> it was, he was just, and, and the question, and then he had a, he says, uh, maybe with a question mark. So he's, he's still uncertain about that chronology, certain aspects of it, but definitely 18, seven and 20 equal 45. So Anyway, we'll, we'll be addressing these things as we go along. Okay, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study once again. Bless each person. Help them in their daily walk. May your angels watch over us. May your Holy Spirit speak through us. And may we be obedient uh, to the little things that you put before us each day. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in you in all these things that are coming upon this earth and in this movement. Help us to have the mind of Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.